adults for our verses. Good to see you all. Uh, we've done this before, but I, I do see a few visitors, and I'd like to take a moment to personally welcome you. I think Olu has some family and friends with us. Uh, let's give them another welcome. I think it's your first time with us, so yes, thank you for waving too. Is there a family that would like to volunteer to sit and get to know them over lunch a little bit better? With Olu and his, um, yes, Ajay, thank you. And Josh too, so maybe you'll have uh, more. Um, and, and the King family is back too. We've missed you the last few weeks. Good to have you back. Welcome. And you have a visitor with you as well. Let's welcome her especially. Thank you. I think it's your first time here. Good to have you. Is there anybody that would like to sit with the King family and get to spend, uh, spend time with them over lunch? Any volunteers? <clears throat> Cliff. Thanks, Cliff. Oh, we had Carrie also. We got lots of volunteers. And there's a brother in the back. Uh, let's welcome him as well. I think he's been here before. Good to have you with us. And uh, does anybody like to sit with him and get to know him a little bit better? Carrie, there you go. Oh, Ed, too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, family, for doing that. Um, if I missed anyone, I always hate to miss people, but okay, I don't think I missed anyone. Thank you. Okay, if you would grab your Bibles uh, and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. If you remember, actually before I go on, I'll mention this. Um, on Friday evening, I will be leaving uh, here to go to Australia for a conference there. Some of you may remember that I was there a couple years ago uh, with one of the churches that is uh, affiliated with us in a loose way. Uh, they've met both Phil and I actually in India. Some of them have. Uh, been blessed by Brother Zach's teaching and very similar model of church and uh, I was really blessed by my visit there and uh, they've been blessed by getting to know us remotely as it were by watching our messages some, some of them watch our broadcasts or watch the videos after they're uh, put out there and uh, have appreciated so much that they've at, for, for a long time been asking us to come back both Phil and I uh, if possible and uh, so the Lord's opened the door for me and guided for me to go there next week. Uh, and if you can pray for me, please do, and for, for Megan and the children here. So I'll leave Friday night. I'll get there Sunday morning, and pretty much they put me to work right away. So I'll be preaching a couple times on Sunday and then periodically through the week in a couple different places in Australia. And then the two weeks from, from this weekend will be the main conference over the Easter weekend for about four days. So pray for that. Uh, maybe I'll send you the schedule over email so you can pray specifically. Thank you for doing that. In Matthew 7, if you remember last week, we looked at the narrow gate and the narrow way and how this is a truth that false prophets would like to hide from, the, from Christendom, like to hide from us because, and the devil ultimately is the one behind it, he would like to hide this truth from us that somehow I can do a one-time thing, even if I've gone through a narrow gate and maybe I was sincere at the, the time of my conversion experience, or I was moved by an altar call and some emotional thing happened, and the devil would love for it to stop there, for me to let up my guard, as it were, and think, well, I've gone through this narrow gate, or what I think is a narrow gate, and that's the end of it. And I continue to live an unchanged life, continue to be defeated by the same sins, asking, having to ask for forgiveness for the same sins over and over and over again for years. That is the testimony of many Christians, sadly. And as we see God's Word, as we meditate and dig into God's Word, as we look at Jesus, the Word made flesh, we see that the standard that Jesus came to show us was much greater than that. That He didn't just come to this earth to give us forgiveness of our sins. That we got, we got mercy when He came on the cross and it was rich and it was, I thank God because, because of that I could actually begin the journey. But for, fee, for me, when I was born again, it put me at the start of the race. Before that, I was running all over like a chicken with its head chopped off. I was just going crazy and doing whatever pleased myself. But once I was born again, I was placed at the, in the starting block, as it were. And oh, how exciting for me that I could actually now see a vision for my life, a direction. I had a finish line now that I, I was going to cross by the end of my life. And I believe in faith that I will be conformed into the image of Jesus. So the devil would love to have us Christians have a wonderful mountaintop experience when we're born again and then live a defeated, dreary, boring, heavy Christian life. 
when in fact the reality is exactly the opposite. The godly man's life is exciting, Proverbs 14, verse 14 says. The Living Bible paraphrases it like that. The godly man's life is the most exciting life. If I was to ask you in the deep, deepest area of your heart, what do you think could be the most exciting life you could live? If you like sports, maybe you'll say, well, I could be like, I could be the greatest in that area, in that field, or be the best basketball player, the best baseball player, or to be a, have, you know, a great scientist, or be an inventor, or a founder of a company, or a venture capitalist, or whatever. Do you know that the godly life, the way Jesus lived it, and the way he calls us to live, beats all of that by far. The godly man's life is the truly most exciting life on this earth. I don't have to wait to get to heaven to experience the kind of joy that comes from dwelling in the presence of God. And if we can get a hold of this, not get a hold of it here, but get a hold of it here where it becomes a reality in our life where I know what it means to dwell in the presence of the Lord. I mean, if it's true, like it says in the Psalms, that at His right hand are pleasures forever. In thy presence is fullness of joy. That means that any joy or happiness that I taste on this earth is just like a sip. It's a taste. It's a temporary taste that I get. But if you want the, 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 the living water that will make you never thirst again, go to the presence of God. And I thank God for showing me that by walking this new and living way, following after Jesus, I can dwell in the presence of the Lord now. That it's not that something magical is going to happen necessarily in that sense after I die, where I live for myself, please myself, was far away from God, but my sins were forgiven, and then in a moment I got into the presence of God. No, for I believe the Christian life is like this, that I start this journey and I'm dwelling in the presence of the Lord. I'm getting more and more intimate with God, drawing closer and closer into Him, where when my physical body finally gives out, it's just the last step of finally being there in His physical presence. It's not just this big leap that must happen. And I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, for years that wasn't my testimony. I thought... It's like, here I am so far away from the presence of God, I wait, can't wait to die, then I'll be in the presence of the, God, of the Lord and it'll be so amazing. But I'm, I'm drawing closer and closer and closer to Jesus than I've ever drawn before. And I know that it's not going to be this big gap necessarily in that sense. Yes, it is going to be a big gap because I won't have my physical body anymore. I'll have a resurrected body. I look forward to that. But in that, that transformation... As you read the New Testament, especially, you see it's a glory to glory. It's not a, like a wretchedness to glory transformation that happens overnight. It's a glory to glory. That's what the new and living way is about. Where step by step, I'm a little bit more like Jesus today. That's why he says in John, in the same context in which he says, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself as he is pure. He says that, um, I lost my train of thought. Okay, we'll, we'll go back to what I'm planning to say. Let's go to Matthew 7. <laughs> Matthew 7, verse 16. Matthew 7, verse 16. You will know them by their fruits. This, he's, Jesus is talking about false prophets and how you can discern them. And maybe we'll come back and look at how we can discern the fruits in false prophets. But I think before we get there, it, it would behoove us to recognize the false fruit in us to see if we are really bearing fruit. And before I get to the step of being able to understand whether a particular teacher is a false prophet or not, perhaps I should see in my own life whether I am deceived, whether there is really fruit coming out of my life. And that's why it's interesting that John took us to, early in his sharing to that, this bearing fruit. So you will know them by their fruits. And I would, let me, let me phrase it this way for the context of this message. You will know your life by its fruit, whether you're bearing fruit or not. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree, now again, before I go on, instead of thinking of this tree as somebody else, as that, you know, that money-loving preacher or that carnal person or that neighbor, let's look at our own lives. Let judgment begin with the household of God. Let a man examine himself. Let a woman examine herself and just see is. is me, this tree that, that God is trying to cultivate here, am I in danger of being this tree that is not bearing good fruit? So that's the way of what we'd like to read it. Verse 18, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. That means if I call myself a Christian and a, a follower of Jesus, I cannot produce bad fruit. And a bad, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. 
if the tree has not been changed, I can try as much as I want. If I'm not truly born again, and if I'm really, the change hasn't happened, I know I'm not walking in the light. I'm not living by the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't imagine that any good fruit would come out of it. Every tree, verse 19, this was already referred to this morning, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, and like John said, I, that's not an enviable, I don't want that. I don't want to be cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. And what I see as I read the New Testament especially, but actually the entire Bible, as I see that this picture of bearing fruit, trees, and bearing fruit is there. It's interwoven throughout the stories in, in the scriptures, right from the very beginning to the end. Let's go there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2 and we'll see that from the very beginning, God gave us this picture of a life that the tree is a good picture of. It's not by accident. I believe it's intentional. And the tree and how a tree grows and it's the life that comes out of it and how it bears fruit is a wonderful picture. It's a beautiful picture of how the Christian life ought to be. So what, what we're talking about here, before I go any further, to, to set the stage for it, as it were, is we've, we've seen already that we're called to walk this new and living way. We've gone through the narrow gate. Now we're seeking to walk this narrow way following after Jesus. But what does that actually look like? How do I do that? What does it mean to walk the new and living way? I think all of us want it. What does that actually look like practically? So beginning in Genesis chapter 2, We see that God's intention in putting mankind, He never said this to any of the rest of creation. He, he, he created everything with the, the ability to reproduce and multiply and grow, but specifically He gave a command to us, to Adam and Eve there, but by, by extension to us. He says, and actually in chapter 1, verse 28, after He had created them, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, Adam and Eve. Now put your name there. You and I, we're not created just to live this life for ourselves and to, you know, barely make it like we sing in the song, just to survive. Be fruitful, multiply, have a thriving life. He told Adam and Eve, and now he tells us, hey, I called you, I put you on this earth first of all so that you could then be born of the Spirit, but having been born again of the Spirit, now be fruitful and multiply. Bear fruit is what he's saying. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Use this now. That was a physical picture that God gave Adam and Eve, a physical command. But in the spiritual, look at it the same way. God, now that you're born again, there's this new creation. Everything was brand new in Genesis 1, wasn't it? But think about you, you and I now as new creation in Christ. What is it that we're called to do now? Is just sit there and wait for Jesus to come and call me home? And just say, Lord, I'm waiting for you to come. Yes, I'm waiting for the Lord to come. But meanwhile, I see the command of the Lord is to me. Be fruitful, Santosh. I put my spirit within you. I've made you a new creation so that in the spiritual realm now, you can be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That wherever you go, this power, this new creation is going with you and you're kind of contaminating in a good way, whatever the opposite, infiltrating this wicked, depraved world with this new creation spirit that I placed in you. That's why we're here on this earth. That's why we have workplaces. That's why we go, um, we are in communities. That's why we live among neighbors. It's why, so that we can infiltrate them with this new creation spirit. But make sure you rule over them, that you're not overpowered by that, he says. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. You know that God, because we're born again and that power that's in us is greater than the power in the world, we're called to rule over, not we don't have to exert our authority. We don't have to beat people into submission because we're children of the eternal kingdom. We don't have to seek positions of importance on this earth. No, on the contrary, we know that we have an authority in us that has authority over everything that we come in touch with. Whether it's a contentious boss, like we heard this morning, or a coworker that just harasses me, or a neighbor, or a, a demon-possessed person. That I'm in, inbuilt in me is this authority, is this rulership mentality in the spiritual realm. And so I don't have to be afraid of the devil. I don't have to be afraid of a person that comes that, that, that's terrorizing me. I don't have to be afraid of a terrorist. I don't have to be afraid of a suicide bomber. I have authority over them because I'm born of this kingdom. This is the call that God gave us. Now let's continue reading in chapter 2. We see this picture in verse 8. The Lord God, Genesis 2 verse 8, God planted a garden toward the east 
in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God caused to grow every tree. Now this is after, this is a little bit different, I think, than the, just the general plantation that God created earlier. This is a unique picture that God is giving now. He caused to grow in this garden every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The purpose of this tree wasn't, wasn't just the vegetation, let the earth look green, uh, creation of the tree. This was, these were trees that were created specifically to fulfill mankind's desire. So they were good for food and pleasing to the sight. For who? For Adam and for Eve. And so God created these trees as it were. Say, Adam, you can have this. And it's for you. And he says, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Also created by God. Then he says in verse 10, now a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. And from there it divided and became four rivers. And you can read about the rest of those four rivers. Continue reading in verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. Here where these trees were and in this garden, this beautiful garden, God placed Adam to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So God had created all of these trees. In fact, God didn't, as far as I see, specifically mention the tree of life. I think Adam and Eve knew about the tree of life. They knew what it was. And it was sort of presented there, as it were, to see what you'll do with it. But specifically, the command was there's this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which you must not eat of. Now, the way I understand it, and Scripture's not clear, but this is my understanding, so take it for what you will. Uh, is that this one tree represented that tree that was not necessarily uh, nurtured and flourishing by this river, as it were. It certainly wasn't a tree, and it certainly does not represent a life that comes from power that God sends, and that river of life that God sends. So that's essentially the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's this one tree, as it were, that looking at it, what they, I don't know that Adam and Eve necessarily understood why. The command was very simple, but we know now that's what it is. This tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which also bears fruit. And now we're going back to what Jesus said is, you will know them by their fruit. How do I know whether I'm eating out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or the tree of life? Essentially this, the fruit that's, that's coming out of your life. If it's the knowledge of good and evil, well, guess what? I don't, it doesn't take a scientist to figure out, this tastes like an apple, must be an apple tree. I don't have to pr pretend that it's an orange tree when I, I see it, it's an apple. And if the fruit that's coming out of my life is this tree, of, is this fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, independent of God, then I see I'm eating out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the difference I see about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that it wasn't sustained by this river, as it were, that this life that comes from God, by contrast, there was this tree of life, which represented a life dependent on God, where my life comes from this river that flows from the throne of God. We sang about it this morning, that it comes from the throne of God, a river. So all the way through Scripture, we see that right at the very beginning, we see that God gave us this picture of trees that bear fruit that are nourished and fertilized and strengthened by a river that comes from God. Now, skip all the way to the very end, the last chapter of the Bible, and you'll see it's there too, Revelation 22. It's like the parentheses, the brackets for everything that God has said in His Word. He gave us this picture at the very beginning of the trees that were there in the Garden of Eden, the tree of life, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this river that flowed from God, that, flow, that, that strengthened the trees. And here we go at the very end in Revelation chapter 2. God is able, uh, about to wrap up everything that He's been speaking to us in, the inspired, in His inspired Word. And he says in verse 22, Then he showed me a river of the water of life. There's that river again. Clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. This is what we sang about this morning, the river of life. And in the middle of its street, this river was like a street. It was flowing down this channel of river. In the middle of its street, it, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. Now, how does a tree be on either side. I don't think we can understand that. But what it was in the beginning was a tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can think of it like that on either side necessarily. But now you see that God has done away with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was His purpose through giving us the book. 
It was more than just, I'll forgive your sins. I will take away from your life this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's no longer there. Now what is there is on either side of the river was the tree of life. Now, it's only about the tree of life. There is no more that choice. God, because of Jesus Christ and because of our oneness with Him, has removed and is in the process of removing this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That is the new and living way. The new and living way that leads me to eternal life where now there's only one thing and one thing left in my life, and that's the tree of life. See, we're still in that state where sometimes I eat out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and I die. That's when we fall into sin, and John makes it clear. If we say we have no sin, we lie and deceive ourselves. And that's my problem is there is still these two trees operating in my life. The tree of life, now I thank God by God's grace and His mercy, by His power, I am eating more of the tree of life today than I, when, I, when I was born again. Before I was born again, it was only the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, re and remember that it's not, it's not sin, it's not adultery and murder and worldliness and those things outwardly, the outward manifestation of it. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, whatever that looks like on the outside, whether it manifests as um, serial killing and uh, adultery or fornication or, or, or lust or lying or gossip or, or, or immodesty. All of those things are just the manifestations of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the way of sanctification, this walking this new and living way, is, is increasingly to, be, to see that what's coming out of my life is the fruit from the tree of life, not from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So, no evidence of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God has completed the work of eliminating this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. See, the curse came in Genesis 3 because we ate out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's when the curse came. Curse came on the ground. Curse came on, on, on the, here. And that we'll live under a sin-cursed earth. But there will no longer be any curse because the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has been done away with. Do we see, dear brothers and sisters, that the root of the curse in our lives, whatever that might be, whether it manifests as bitterness or anger or evil speaking or unable to control my temper or lust or whatever it might be, the root of that curse is this tree that is still there. But there will no longer be any curse and the throne of, the God, of, of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night. And they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun. You know that, that we don't need the sun anymore. It's not going to be always sun. It's going to be no sun because God himself will be our light. Because the Lord God will immune, illumine them and they will reign forever and ever. And this, so this, this process of eliminating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is what John words this way, that the world is passing away. The world is passing away, you'll see on that next slide. Yeah, no, it's there actually. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the world. And he says in 1 John 2 verse 17 that the world is passing away. So what is happening is this tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a dying tree as it were. And if we're still, even if we call ourselves Christians, if we're still dependent on this tree and coming to God with this knowledge of good and evil mentality, guess what? We are off the world. And we are going to be passing away with the world. And the world is full of, and I'll tell you this, with the, with the explosion of social media, what has happened is, I think, is that there's more of this fruit. It's so much easier to be dependent on knowledge. Because it's at your fingertips. In fact, you can get the, the Bible in any kind of any number of different languages, in the Greek and the Hebrew, and this concordance and the other thing, at your fingertips. Has it actually translated into more of the tree of life? I hope it has. It can. The more we have, the more study tools we have, and the more translations and, and concordances we have should be drawing us to the tree of life, but it could also, on the other hand, be drawing us to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, where this tree despite my reading of God's Word, is enhancing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Who is the greatest example of that? What do you think? The devil, exactly. The devil is the greatest example of the one who is built, bought into this tree of the knowledge of good and evil mentality. And believe me, he knows the Bible better than the greatest theologian, the greatest preacher, the greatest apologist. The devil is the best of them all in terms of knowledge, proving that the mere knowledge of it is not result in life. 
In fact, the devil represents the exact opposite of life. If there's one thing that can be represented by death, it's the devil, right? He is the prince of this world. He is the prince of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He is the ruler of that. And on the other side, you see Jesus, who is the, the life that lights all the world, light all men, like we sang, the life to light all men. So this world is passing away, and it will eventually be completely destroyed, like we see here in Revelation 22. There will be no more. This is after the devil has been cast into the bottomless pit. Now it's the end. It's the end. It's over. And what's left? The tree of life. And those who have been eating and dependent and feeding off of this tree of life will be the ones remaining. I have been meditating a lot over the last, somehow the Lord's impressed on me, over the last month or so, maybe six weeks, of this life of being filled with the Holy Spirit in a way that I knew about and had partaken of, uh, and had been partaking of for, for many years, I would say. But it's come to me in a fresh way, and, and, and the Lord's been working in my own heart, and I... I, I'm hesitant to speak too much on that yet because it's still being worked out on me and maybe it will come out in, in the things I preach periodically. But I believe that this is, for me, it's, it's come to me this way. And maybe it applies to our homes and our, to our churches this way. That I, I feel like I reached a, a, a crisis point in my life, as it were, where, where I either learn to live a life that is full and anointed uh, and constantly baptized in the power of the Holy Spirit or I shrivel and die. And it's not just a one-time crisis where, okay, I've got through that crisis, now I go back to living this whole life where I'm constantly in this crisis mode, as it were. And like that quote that John, uh, John quoted earlier about this, don't be afraid of that crisis. Because the crisis, what it does for me is I'm in this crisis mode where whether I'm going through a difficult trial or not, my mentality is crisis mentality, which is what? I dare not even take one half bite out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, that's my problem. That's my danger, is that when things are good, I'm not in crisis mentality. I'm in just sort of let my guard down, and I take a bite out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil every now and then, and then things start to spiral a little bit like they did for Adam and Eve, and all of a sudden I was like, oh man, what was I thinking? How did I allow it to get to be so bad? How did I allow my discouragement or my depression or my anger at God or my unbelief or my fear or my worry or my lust or my anger or my bitterness or my unforgiveness to get to the point where it manifests that way? And now I'm in this crisis mentality, as it were, where I say, Lord, I dare not eat even half. I don't, I don't even want to look at it in a coveting way, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I want to live dependent on your Holy Spirit so much that I cannot go on another minute. Now, I'm saying this as a, as a desire of my heart. I'm trying to get to the place increasingly, and the Lord is bringing me there, more and more increasingly where I cannot live another moment unless I know I am clothed with power from on high. Because I've, I've, I've gotten tired of making it through life without it. Where I asked for the power of the Holy Spirit, I asked God to give me His power and kind of got tired of asking after a while because I wasn't really that desperate for it. And so I found another way to live my life. And I'm realizing more and more that this other way that we can find these other ways that we find to make it as a Christian that do not come, that does not come from a emptiness and a brokenness and a desperation at the throne of God where I say, Lord, give me that river of living water or I will die. Mentality results in a, a, him really coming and fill, filling, filling them with power. I think that's the mentality that the disciples had. They were desperate. They had had Jesus as their companion and their protection for three and a half years, and then he was gone, and they were left alone. That's the sense you get and read when you read John 16. They're terrified. They're lonely, and they're desperate, and they're empty, and they're like, man, let's just go back to our old way of life. And God says, no, -uh. ask me for power. I've got power for you to live like Jesus lived, and they did. And that's the, founda the, the foundation is Christ, the chief cornerstone, and the church is being built on those stones, the apostles and the prophets who've gone ahead of us, who've shown us this life where they were not able to go and preach the gospel into all the nations and to J Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world until they had been clothed with power from on high. I see two pictures of the, of the Holy Spirit in Scripture, and there may be more, but the two I'll share with you today are, first of all, the fire of the Holy Spirit. In um, Matthew chapter 3, let's turn there. You know that verse probably in Hebrews 12 that says, Our God is a consuming fire. 
and uh, the picture of, of the Holy Spirit is often, the, the picture that's often used for the Holy Spirit is this fire. There were tongues of fire over them, representing that God had now imparted into them this fire of the Holy Spirit. But what was the purpose of that fire? Have you thought about it? Yes, we know what tongues did because they spoke in other tongues and they had boldness. That's actually more important than speaking in heavenly or other tongues that we don't know with our mind. More important than speaking in tongues is this tongue that has been anointed with power to be my witnesses. That's a, that's a given for every one of us. Whether you speak in heavenly tongues or not, you must be, like Joshua was saying earlier, we must be bold witnesses. And for that, we need this tongue of fire as it were. But why fire? What is the purpose of fire? So let's look here in Genesis, in, in, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. This is John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus Christ to come, whom we know was, is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. He is the one who gives the fullness of the Holy Spirit to those who ask. Verse 7, when he saw, when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees, so here was John the Baptist preaching a message of repentance, baptism in water and repentance from sins. He says, repent for the kingdom of, uh, is, is at hand. In verse 2, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the, make his path straight and all this stuff. So he was preaching repentance. Come to the narrow gate, come through the narrow gate. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. And guess what? Along came some of these tree of the knowledge of good and evil experts that said, hey, I like that too, that sounds good. Let me take a little bit of your repentance message as well. And there are some who will take this preaching, the message of repentance, and add it to their tree of knowledge of good and evil experience. Did you get that? I, I did that for many years, where repentance and this preaching of repentance, I thought, well, there's the worldly people that you never hear about repentance, but thank God I'm one of those that does believe in repentance. It's not just, I say a prayer, I do repent, but it's possible to add all of these things to the fact that I'm still living off the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and sanctification, and fellowship, discipleship, repentance, faith, I can just add it to my tree where I am still eating out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's what the Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to do. So the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism said to them, he said to them, he says, I'm too smart for you guys. I see what you're trying to do. You don't really want to let go of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You just want to add to it. It doesn't work that way. You brood of vipers. Who want you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. There's a repentance and there's a fruit that comes as a result of that repentance that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had no interest in. Interest in. They wanted the, the talk about repentance. They wanted the conversation about repentance. But the fruit that comes from repentance, which comes from a self-denying, cross-carrying life, they didn't want that. In fact, they crucified the man who spoke on that, Jesus. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, Oh, we have Abraham for our father, for I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. And that's the problem is the Pharisees and the Sadducees prided themselves on the fact that they were Abraham's children. And I have that quote on there. God wants living children, not just people carrying a birth certificate. And it's so easy. I know I lived like this for many years too, where my identity card was, guess what? I have a birth certificate. I was born again on such and such a date. Guess what? I'm one of your children. But God, I, I see that. I mean, would it be enough for me if, if one of my children is not really alive? but they have a birth certificate, the fact that they were born. No, I want living children. And that's the same way with God spiritually now. He says, it's not enough for me that you wave this birth certificate in my face saying, hey, guess what, Jesus, I'm one of yours because on such and such a date in 1999, I gave you my life. Yes, that's great that it started, but what does that translate into now? He says, because that's exactly the problem the Pharisees and the Sadducees had. Is we're Abraham's children. I can trace my lineage all the way to Abraham. They could. But that faith, that righteousness that Abraham had, which his faith, it says, was reckoned to him as righteousness, that was lacking in their lives. So they had the genealogy, they had the lineage, but they didn't have the fruit. Verse 10, and here we get to the crux of it. He says, so what does God do with this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He says, he lays, the ax is already laid at the root of the tree, therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The only solution to eating off the tree of life is to get rid of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil completely. And more and more as God shows me where I'm eating off of that tree, I crucify that. I get rid of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I allow the sword to fall on my self-life. This is what Jesus meant when he said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. 
If you want anybody who wants to be my disciple, must take up his cross, must crucify his flesh with its desires, and come and follow me. See, because we, you know, we can read something like in Matthew 7 where it says, you must bear good fruit. And I think, well, I'm in a part of church where they talk about bearing good fruit. So I've got to give this appearance of bearing good fruit. And I know that out of my flesh just comes corruption and corruption and corruption. But now I've got to go to church on Sunday morning. So I hang these plastic fruit or these nice looking fruit that looks real. And maybe it's real fruit. Maybe I went to the store and picked up a bunch of apples because we're the, the apple tree church. So I buy a bunch of, a bushel of apples and clip them onto my tree. I've done that. That's hypocrisy. That's exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees were all about. Presenting in front of others a life that they really didn't have inside. Inside they were dead men's bones, Jesus said. But outside, oh, they, they, they were the most holy people from the outward appearance of things. That was the best apple you'd ever seen in your whole life till you take a bite out of it and realize Paper. It's plastic. There's no life in it. There's no, there's no nourishment in it. It's not coming from inside. It is somebody who's gone and bought something and you take it off and it's just like, well, you know, it's decaying on there. And then next morning I got to put new apples on there because the ones that I clipped on last night have died out. And this is not the Christian life. This is not the new and living way that Jesus opened through his flesh for us to follow. This is the old tree of the knowledge of good and evil with now I used to be a corrupt tree but now I know I've got to be an apple tree so guess what instead of actually it's starting from the seed of an apple I keep my tree of the knowledge of good and evil and I clip on a bunch of apples and other good fruit that I think I'm supposed to manifest I'm supposed to be loving because the fruit of the spirit is love so I manufacture a love and I clip on love especially when I'm around others because when I'm by myself and nobody can see me, or if it's just my wife or just my husband, I don't really have to love. Because it's not real. I can, I, can, uh, I can take down the clip because it's a little tiresome to stand there hanging, holding this clip on the tree. I know I'm supposed to be full of joyful, so I pretend like I'm so happy when the music comes on and when I'm around others, but deep down inside there's no joy. I'm supposed to have peace because that's a fruit of the Spirit. I don't really have it inside. It's not coming from within, and so I clip it on. This is the life that comes from being controlled by the law. And, and the more, I, I, I believe this, that the more we receive preaching on holiness and a high standard of the Christian life, the more, if we're not really serious about crucifying our flesh and doing away with that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the more we will resort to clipping on these fruits. But the secret, my dear brothers and sisters, is in that, in that axe being laid to the root of the tree. That's why he says the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Instead of worrying about in a frenzy, oh, so-and-so from the church is coming over to our home. Quick, let's put the fruit up on the tree. Instead of getting, living with that mentality that's in a frenzy all the time because of who's watching me and who's not. Oh, do they hear what I said? Or here I am speaking rudely to my wife and then the doorbell rings and I think, well, was the window open? Do they really hear how I spoke to my wife? Instead of having to live with that fear, I, Jesus comes and lays the axe to the root of the tree. This tree that's not bearing good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And then he says in this context, John the Baptist is giving a beautiful picture of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is a, who is a consuming fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. That's the start. I'll bring you to the narrow gate. And Jesus will take you through that because of his, of his blood. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. And I am not fit to remove his sandals. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And, I, and, and continue reading verse 12. His winnowing fork in his hand. And he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn. And he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. To burn up this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And if there's any chaff left over, he'll burn that up too. So that there's nothing left. And little by little, from glory to glory, there's less of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is ultimately self. There's less of myself and more of God, more of His glory, more of His glory till when I finally see Jesus face to face, when He returns, it's complete. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil has been completely burned out, rooted out from my life. This is the first ministry of the Holy Spirit. And um, let me show you this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Or before we go there, I don't know if you saw this in Genesis 3, that after they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and were caught, and God came and confronted them, and he cast them out of the Garden of Eden. Look at what he does there. 
Genesis 3 verse 22. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life now and try to live from this tree of life, grabbing it themselves while still eating out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is, I, I understand it this way, a perpetual living in, in bondage. And that's why the, the soul, the devil, his, you know, that created being, he's never going to be completely extinguished. The, the soul is never completely extinguished. Those who have eaten out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will be cast into hell for all eternity and will remain alive in their souls there for all eternity. And so uh, he says, now he might stretch out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God sent him from, out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. He drove man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. Did you see that? Did you know that that's what happened? And it's a spiritual picture. The tree of the garden, tree of the life is not there anymore as a physical tree, but it's there spiritually as well. And we're faced with that choice, the tree of life or the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But around this tree of life is this flaming sword. This flaming sword that says, if you want to eat out of the tree of life, you must crucify your flesh. You must lay the sword to your self-life. Give up living your life the way you think you should live. Give up living your life saying those things that you think, well, that's what, how I am. That's how I'm just going to say it. When the sword is laid on the self-life, then I come in. That's why it says that, we, we looked at this last week too, that the way to the most holy place to eat out of the tree of life was through the flesh, through his flesh, Jesus' flesh. And the example I have there is that Jesus never pleased himself. He could have done that thing which would have made him feel good. He could have said that thing which would have made him feel better. He could have just blurted out that thing to get it off his chest. But he never once did it, not even once. And now he says, if you want to know the way to life, Learn this way of crucifying your flesh where it's going to hurt. You're going to have to die to yourself. You're going to give up, have to give up your agendas and your ideas. But you will eat out of the tree of life and you will live forever. And you will partake of my divine nature. So around this tree of life was this flaming sword. And I believe that that's still there. That's what it means to take up the cross. Jesus made the call very clear. If anyone wants to be his, my disciple, he must go through the flaming sword. If I could put it that way. If anyone wants to eat out of the tree of life, the devil will present to you, false prophets will come, we saw in Matthew 7 verse 15, saying, you know what, this whole, this, this uh, dying to self and um, living, taking up your cross and all, that's just, that's, ah, that's old covenant, man. Live a, Christ called to set you, call, came to set you free. Just eat out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You don't have to go through any sword. There is no flaming sword around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's why it's so easy to eat out of it. That's why it's easy for me to resort to that tree and to have that fruit in my life because it's just my, my human temperament, my human nature that way. But when Jesus lays the ax to the root of that tree and I start to eat of the tree of life, he shows me that if I want to eat of this fruit, it's going to cost me something. And that's why Jesus said, he didn't, never gave an altar call. He said, sit down and count the cost. Let me show you. If you really want to be my disciple, it's not going to be just, I say the prayer and I go back to living my old life out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's going to cost you something, man. You're going to have to go through this flaming sword. It's going to cost you everything, in fact. You're going to have to leave all your possessions. You're going to give up. You have to, you know, like he told in Luke 9, he told that, that one man who wanted to go and bury his, dad, his father. He says, let the dead bury their dad. It's going to cost you that. The other man wanted to go back and say goodbye to his family. He says, no, you've got to cut yourself off from that family. You may find that the flaming sword comes between you and your carnal family that's trying to draw you back into, into worldliness. You may find that, that you will find that that flaming sword cuts you off from carnally minded friends, carnally minded things, carnally minded conversation. Why? I mean, it hurts. You can, you can live forever thinking, well, is that really going to cost me something? Am I going to go to hell because I do that? Now the question to ask is, am I going to miss the, the tree of life if I do that? That's a completely different conversation. That's a completely different question to have. So the fire, the fire, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is a fire. The second ministry I see is the river. Um, John chapter 7, Jesus said this. You probably know these words, but let's look at them quickly. John chapter 7. I see that as... 
the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes and uh, as the Holy Spirit comes, dwells within me and lays the axe to the root of the tree and that tree is burned up and then the chaff is burned up too. Then another aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit comes in and this is John 7 verse 37 where Jesus said, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink and he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The life of being filled with the Holy Spirit and walking full of the Holy Spirit is like a life that's fed by a river of living water. And he clarifies in verse 39, John does, the Holy Spirit through John clarifies that this Jesus spoke of, but this he spoke of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So what happened? Jesus was glorified later on, taken up into heaven, and then the Holy Spirit came. And on the day of Pentecost, this river of living water came down, looking for any human being that he could fill to strengthen and to lift up and to give grace and to give power, to empower us as Christians to walk the new and living way. Now let me show you this passage in Ezekiel chapter 47, which is, I think, one of the most beautiful pictures of this way, of walking this new and living way. Because I, I, if you're like me, after a while you realize, okay, I've been, do, I've been putting the, trees, uh, the, the fruit on the tree and I don't want to do that, but how do I do that? How do I get this life to come out from within me unhindered? How do I have the, both the will and the desire, the, both the will and the power to deny myself? I find it so easy just to slip back into my old behavior. And I think, man, I, I, I don't want to do that thing. I don't want to speak like that. I don't want to treat people like that. I want to be loving. I want to be kind. I want to be generous. But it's just I slip back into selfishness and self-centeredness. How do I live this life? And false prophets will come and tell you, well, you grit your teeth and you try this technique and do that other thing and have accountability around you, you know. If you, if you're, if you have bad habits, you have people keep you accountable who call you every now and then and how you're doing and all this stuff. All these techniques won't work. It requires the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit coming and filling my being. Look at this. So Ezekiel 47, verse 1, we see a picture of this river of living water. He brought me back to the door of the house and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the house toward the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from south of the altar. is flowing from the house, from the temple of God. And he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gate by way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side. A little trickle of water coming out from this presence of God, from the most holy place. A little trickle of water coming out. And when the man went out toward the east with a line in his hand, he measured a thousand cubits, and he led me through the water, water reaching the ankles. Now here's somebody that's walking the new and living way. He's following this water, as it were, to its source. He's following this water to its source, and he's finding it's getting a little bit deeper. The circumstances, the crises are getting a little bit more intense. The pressure, the temptation is a little bit more intense than it was. And you thought it was hard yesterday. It's even harder today because you're pressing into God. Have you ever found that? You think, God, I'm going to really wholeheartedly follow you. And you get more of God. And guess what? Now the trials get worse. Now you're in deeper than you were. Before that, it was just a trickle. But now you're pressing into this. You took a little sip of that. Man, this is life. I want more of this. And you press in and you think, God, I want more of you. And guess what? Things get worse in your life. It says... Um, it gets deeper. He led me through the water, water, water reaching the ankles. So then he keep, you keep going and you think, well, there are some who when the standard is raised a little bit, turn around and walk away. That happened in Jesus' day all the time. The, ra the standard was raised a little bit, they turned and ran. Little, raised a little bit more, some more people left. You read that in John 5, 6, and 7. Finally, he turns to the 12 and says, you guys want to leave too? And they said, no, you have the words of eternal life. I'm, I, I've, I've tasted enough of you that I want to keep going with you, Jesus. I don't care how deep it gets, and I don't even know what that's going to look like. I don't know how to swim, but I don't want to run away from this water. It's, become an, it's come up to my ankles now, and I'm a little afraid of where else it might lead me, and what else of my possessions and my desires and my ambitions and my goals and the way I want to live my life, you might ask me to give up. But I want the eternal life, and I'm tired of drinking of these fountains that never satisfy and I'll give up anything. That's why it takes us coming to a place of desperation where there's no other option except to pursue God. This one pure and holy passionate obsession. I like that word, obsession. 
I mean, obsession is a word that you use in the world in a, in a bad way. It's just like, man, he's obsessed with that. Think about being obsessed with eternal life that way. Where I'm so taken up with it, it's just constantly in my thoughts. I mean, if you talk to me about other things, sure, I might, but I'm obsessed with this. So he measured, verse 4, a thousand and led me through the water, water reaching through the knees. Oh, it's getting deeper now. But I'm still okay because my feet are grounded. I'm still, I'm still on my feet and I still got my convictions that I can hold on to and I can still kind of walk in my own strength. But again, he measured a thousand and led me through water, water reaching the loins. Now I'm in the, up to my waist. But guess what? My feet are still on the ground and I'm walking. And I got this figured out. I know how to handle waist deep water as long as my feet are still on the ground. Well, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> Verse 5, he measured a thousand more. This is the new and living way. Measured a thousand more, and it was a river that I could not ford. Now, it's ten feet deep. It, before that, it was three feet deep. My feet were on the floor, and I was good. I had a confidence in my own ability. I knew I could make it. I could grit my teeth and get through this trial by hook or by crook. And then it got more difficult. Then the temptation got worse. Then they treated me worse than I thought they could, I could ever be treated. And now what do I do when I can't feel the bottom with my feet? Now I'm in 10 feet deep and I'm treading water. He measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not ford for the water had risen enough water to swim in a river that could not be forded. By forded he means no longer can you just walk your way, wade, you, wade your way through life. But you know, it's so much easier to swim than to wade your way through ankle deep or uh, knee deep or waist deep water. When you watch a swimmer, and I can't swim very well, but I watch swimmers swimming and it's effortless. And they can go, and I, I read about that lady that swam from Cuba to Florida. I mean, for days, she just kept swimming. I asked me to swim for about five minutes and I'm in over my head. I, I don't know what to do. I think I'm going to die. And this is the Christian life where you, where you, you realize this effortless life where God has allowed you intentionally to get to the place in your life where you can no longer wade in your own strength. You can't rely on your knees and the things you've done and your Bible study and your devotion and your godly home and all of this stuff to carry you through that trial because the bottom has fallen out all of a sudden. He says, now swim. It's in you. I've given you the power. So he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me bank to, back to the bank of the river. Then he said to me, these waters go out toward the eastern region and go down into the Araba, the desert. Then they go toward the sea, being made to flow into the sea. And the waters of the sea become fresh. And look at the quality of life from the people that are around this water. It will come about that every living creature which swarms in every place where the river goes will live. Everywhere that this river goes, it results in life. I thank God that I'm in a place now where I'm not relying on wading through anymore because the river is flowing. And I'm flowing with that and God is filling me with, that, filling me with those rivers of living water. But the result of it is, instead of relying on my own strength, instead of wading my way through life, I'm experiencing true eternal life in my life in areas one after the other. Every living creature, think about that, every area of your life. Is there even a small area in your life, my dear brother, dear sister, dear child, dear young person, is there even a small area in your life where you don't have that thriving life? Is it a small, is it a small thought, way of thinking? Is it a small habit you have or a big habit, no matter what it may be? Every living creature, every area where this river goes will have life, will have thriving life. And there will be very many fish, for these waters go there, and the others become fresh, so that everything will live where the river goes. Keep this phrase in mind, if you will. It's, it's running through my mind. Everything will live where the river goes. Are you in that river? Is that river flowing through you? Is the rivers, are the rivers of living water that Jesus promised flowing through me so that everything will live this eternal life where the river goes? Yeah, amen.